So this is Just give me the nod and, and I'm happy to get going. Fantastic. Uh, please I, go ahead when, you, when you're ready, Richard. I can see the screen, right? Me too. Yeah. Okay. Should I, should I get started? Yeah. Go ahead. Everybody's, okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, a, a great, great to chat with you. It's about 7 a.m. over here. I'm, I'm thrilled to have this conversation. Uh, my name is Richard Adler. I am an ophthalmologist. I'm actually a cornea specialist out of Baltimore, Maryland. And um, this, this phone call is one of two. Um, and I hope this is extremely, extremely valuable to you guys because what I want to do is take IPL and really reduce it to the practical aspects. But not just the practical aspects. There's going to be two phone calls. The first phone call today is where I hope to take the science of it and really kind of reduce it to the most important aspects, most practical aspects, most compelling aspects of the science so that you can help communicate this to your, your customers. And then in the second phone call next week, instead of focusing on the science, um, instead of giving you a physician's perspective on the science, next week, I'm going to do something which is not done too often, and I'm going to give you a physician's perspective on the sale. And believe it or not, that's a little nuance, which is really important. Um, we oftentimes learn about uh, sales techniques from general sales folks, but we rarely hear about it from the perspective of the doctor, what works and what doesn't. So that's what we'll do next week. Quick little background on myself. Like I said, I'm an ophthalmologist, a cornea specialist. I have been using IPL for ocular surface disease since 2010. 2010, that's right. And of course, back then, it wasn't the Lumina system. It was a Palomar system which has since been purchased by Sinusure. But I do have a, tons of experience with the technology, with the disease state, and even with, um, uh, with alternative device options. So I, I hope my perspective is valuable to everybody. I want to also start by telling you that these conversations are good news. This is good news for you guys because this technology is amazing. This is one of the best kept secrets, certainly in the States, um, in eye care. For so long, people have not appreciated the potential of this device in an enormously prevalent condition to be wildly successful. So you actually, I want you guys to be excited that you have the opportunity to talk to uh, doctors about this technology. It is truly one of the best kept secrets and it's time we get the word out. Um, regardless, um, go ahead and, and advance the slide for me if you can. Mark, thank you. Regardless, um, you know, I, I, it, dry eye disease is sort of unusual in the sense that despite its prevalence, despite its prominence, many doctors, and tell me if you've noticed this, don't love treating this disease. It, it, it's been a little bit difficult. Uh, many doctors view dry eye disease with a sense of, of, of inefficiency, with a sense of futility, um, and unfortunately, um, with the sense of lack of profitability, I, I, especially in ophthalmology. You know, I could be making more money doing something else. So unfortunately, attitudes towards dry eye has been relatively poor. Um, but what we have with IPL is an opportunity to, to really um, get doctors excited about this disease state again. So again, this particular talk, today's talk, which is the science, I'm going to divide into two sections. The first, I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective on dry eye, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of perspective on the treatment protocol. Let me start by giving you guys a pearl. The key to success with selling these devices, with distributing these devices, is simplicity. Simplicity. If this discussion with your clients, with your customers, becomes too complex, you oftentimes lose lose their attention and their interest. So I am going to try to reduce a lot of the aspects of this conversation into very simple terms that you can communicate. So when we talk about the definition of dry eye, when we talk about algorithms, when we talk about mechanisms of action, and even when we talk about a protocol, simplicity sells. Simplicity sells. So it's going to be very important for you to be able to communicate this in an easy way that maximizes both attention and retention, two challenges that we have when you have a short period of time to talk to doctors. Simplicity sells. So again, we are going to be talking about answers to that sort of dissonance doctors have with dry eye. 
ways to make it profitable, ways to make it efficient, and ways to make it effective. All right, go ahead, Mark. Let's advance to the first, the next slide, rather. Um, one really important aspect for you to be maximally effective and for doctors to be maximally receptive, you have to be organized in how you think about this, and you have to organize doctors thinking about this. So I've created this little pyramid here, which again, I, I hopefully just gives you a broad picture of why you're there, what you're doing, and if you can communicate this, if you can organize your recipients, your inter the, the, the doctors thinking themselves, you're going to be more effective. So at, if you look at the bottom of this pyramid, at a very broad level, we ask the question, why eye care? Why are we even in the eye care space? And let me just briefly give you some reasons why. Um, eye care is certainly a unique opportunity because those of us who go into this field already have a proclivity towards devices, towards technology. It's a very high-tech field. Oftentimes, we work hand-in-hand -hand with optometry and ophthalmology, and that creates unique partnerships opportunities that can be very valuable in IPL. Also, in eye care, we're already used to using lasers and lights. That's something we're already familiar with. We already certainly in the States have an understanding of both insurance and cash-based procedures that might sort of mix. So we already, as eye care professionals, are well positioned to accept this. Dry eye diseases, we'll see. Why are we even talking about, so within eye care, why should we be talking about dry eye? Well, as you'll see, it's one of the most prevalent conditions we treat. So there's huge opportunities. Again, moving up this period pyramid as we try to organize our thinking about who we are, um, why within dry eye should we be talking about inflammation? Well, as we'll see, it's now the standard of how we understand this disease. If you're not treating the inflammation, you're not treating dry eye. And then why should we be thinking about devices? Well, devices, put, put quite succinctly, devices are drug-free, drop-free, insurance-free, cash options. Just those four things right there resonate with doctors. And let me tell you, devices also have the unusual advantage of allowing doctors to interact with their patients when they perform the treatment. That intangible benefit is huge. So again, as I'm moving up this period, we're trying to understand our role, understand why we matter. So why devices? Within devices, there's many choices. And next week, I'll talk to you a little bit about the iLight device and how we can respond to that. But before we get to that next week, just understanding why should we be talking about IPL with all the choices out there? Well, we should be talking about IPL because it's the only one that treats inflammation. There are no other devices that does that. And again, if you're not treating the inflammation, you're not treating this disease. That's why we're talking about IPL. And if we get to the very tip of the pyramid, understanding our role, understanding our identity, understanding why this is compelling, the question is why the Luminous? Why the M22? Why Optima IPL? And again, with a number of advantages, a commitment like no other company to the eye care space that I have seen in the history of eye care, with a number of unique features such as uh, different sized light tips, interchangeable wavelengths done easily. With um, these kind of advantages, with no disposables and no click fees, we can understand why the Optima IPL is at the top of the pyramid. Top of the pyramid. Fantastic, Mark. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. So again, what I just did there was to give you a really broad overview to organize your thinking about why this science matters and to help it make it matter to other doctors. Now, let's take a brief moment to understand why dry eye disease should be a huge opportunity. When you talk to your potential customers about this technology, they need to be reminded that we're talking about opportunity, huge opportunity. Just some quick numbers in the States here, we saw about 35 million Americans recently diagnosed with dry eye disease. That's huge. Just to give you a little perspective, in the same year, there were 3.5 million cataracts performed, 2.5 million diagnoses of glaucoma. The opportunity is immense. Not only that, but we're actually under-diagnosing this disease. We miss it. If you think about patients who come into our practices, oftentimes they're not coming in with chief complaints that they even connect with this disease. They don't know that their eyes aren't supposed to be tired, ache, and strained by the end of the day. They don't know that tearing is a sign of dry eyes. They don't know that blurry vision doesn't always mean you need new glasses. So many times we actually underdiagnose this, this condition, and there's more than 33 million. We have a number of very common medical conditions that increase the risk for dry eye. 
high blood pressure from the medications, diabetes, hormonal changes, thyroid disease, just to name a few. We have very common classes of medications that most patients are on, antihistamines, antidepressants, anti-reflux, birth control, and acne medications. We haven't even talked about social history, such as computer use, phone use, caffeine and alcohol. I mean, there are so many reasons that we should be thinking about dry eye. The opportunity is immense. It actually becomes difficult to think of a patient that your doctor saw who did not, did not have a risk factor for dry eye. So again, as we communicate this, the doctors remind them of the immense opportunity that is in dry eye disease. A fascinating study was done also called the PROOF study, PROOF study. And in this study, it identified that patients who had 20-20 vision, 20-20 vision, oftentimes still complained of moderate to severe dry eye 56.7% of the time in their 2020. These are very frustrating patients for those of us who perform cataract surgery or spend a lot of time writing an eyeglass prescription. They're 2020 and still miserable. Doctors can relate to that. These are frustrating patients, and it's important to remember the role of dry eye. And finally, for those of you who interact with surgeons like cataract surgeons, do not forget to emphasize why it matters, why dry eye matters even to their practice. They may say to you, you know, I'm a surgeon. I don't have time for dry eye. That's wrong. That's very wrong. We understand that dry eye impacts cataract surgery in some very important ways. Oftentimes, I'll be talking to a group of doctors and I'll say, do you believe cataract surgery can cause or worsen dry eye? And all the hands go up. <laughs> but then I say, well, how many of you do something perioperatively to manage that risk? And all hands go back down, amazingly. Well, then I say, well, how many of you do something perioperatively to manage the risk of infection? Sure enough, all hands go up. But do you see the double standard? Do you see the inconsistency? Doctors recognize both dry eye and infections as risks of cataract surgery, yet they tend to selectively only manage one. So right away, we have enormous opportunity, even around cataract surgery. Bill Tratler did an interesting study. He asked the question of 136 patients going into routine cataract surgery, what percent would have level two dry eye or higher? Level two is mild staining. In his study of 136 um, eyes, 81% had this before cataract surgery, yet only 22% were told about it ahead of time. Dry eye disease around cataract surgery negatively impacts the accuracy of our measurements and the outcome of our refractive results. So even if you're talking to cataract surgeons, they have to be thinking about dry eye. Some doctors bundle IPL around premium cataract surgery. Some doctors treat them separately, but regardless, IPL can form a really important part around cataract surgery. And for patients who are already spending money, it's a very simple question. If I could offer you another procedure, yes, another one, that could potentially improve your results after cataract surgery, would you want it? When framed that way, patients understand, and you can form a very compelling reason. Bottom line, dry eye equals opportunity. It's everywhere. It's very common. Mark, thank you. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. I also want to point this out to you. As you may know, the, the, the tear film has three layers, of course. The watery layer, which forms up the majority of the tear layer, of course. And then you have the lipid layer on top, which prevents evaporation. And the innermost layer that we call mucin. And mucin is the layer that allows the tears to stick. <laughs> this slide is important because it, it identifies what we oftentimes think of a construct in terms of dry eye. We have evaporative dry eye and we have aqueous deficient. And that is still the way a lot of doctors think about this. Realistically, it's not true. But you can take advantage of this fact because the reality is most forms of dry eye are mixed. It would be exceptionally rare to have only a meibomian gland deficiency, that's a lipid deficiency leading to evaporative disease with also, without also having some aqueous. The reality time, most is mixed. But the reason that this slide is important is most doctors who think about IPL have it in their mind that IPL is only useful in the evaporative form, that it's only useful around meibomian gland disease, and that if you were to have a patient with a predominantly aqueous deficient state that they would not be appropriate patient for IPL. And that's just false. That's false. 
And this is also a really important point because as we try to make a case against other devices, such as thermal pulsation, which only treats lip, which lipid deficiencies with the meibomian glands, it is essential for you to recognize and tell your doctors that with IPL, we're treating both aqueous deficient and evaporative. By treating the inflammation, which IPL does so well, we effectively improve both states and, of course, mixed states, which is what almost all dry eye is. So although this dichotomy exists, this construct exists, it's out there, remind doctors that we have an opportunity to improve both kinds of dry eye with IPL. It is not true that it is only effective in evaporative forms. Really important there. Let's go ahead and advance the next slide. Okay, the eye-skin connection. Again, we're talking about the science in this talk. We're talking about how to kind of translate science into opportunity. And again, here we have opportunity because we as eye care professionals, and if you remember the pyramid, this was the bottom layer, the most substantial layer. We as eye care professionals are already comfortable with the connection between the eye and the skin. We might not realize it, but we are. There are many disease states which involve both the eye and the skin. Perhaps the best known example is rosacea, and it's pictured here. Rosacea is not the only one, though. We treat infectious diseases, such as herpes, that involve the eye and the skin. We treat autoimmune conditions, such as lupus and sarcoid. Um, we treat even uh, cancers that involve the skin and the eye. Doctors are already um, allergic disease, severe allergic disease called atopic keratoconjunctivitis, eye and skin. Many, many examples where we're already comfortable with the connection between the eye and the skin, and that's important. Rosacea is probably the most important example, and as you can see in the slide, it's pretty startling, 80%, 80, and I've seen studies as high as 85, 85% or 86 even, 80 to 86% of patients with facial rosacea also have ocular rosacea, 80 to 85%. That's a lot. And as we know, patients with ocular rosacea, about 86% of them have dry eye. So you see the connection between facial rosacea and dry eye is pretty smooth. It's pretty impressive. Again, almost 85% of folks with ocular rosacea, facial rosacea have ocular rosacea and about 86% of ocularization patients have dry eye. Very important connection. The skin-eye connection is real. In the United States, this device doesn't even have approval for treatment of the eye, but it hasn't been a problem. It hasn't been a problem because we're treating, we're not treating the eye, we're treating the skin. We're treating the skin. And a lot of times doctors feel a sense of relief when they realize, you know what, that's right. We're not actually treating the eye itself. We're treating the skin. We're treating the skin around the eye. And that's something I'm comfortable with. That's something you're comfortable with. So again, um, this has been, it's important to remind our doctors that the eye-skin connection is real. They're already familiar with it. And that's really what we're focusing on at this condition. Very nice. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of words on this slide. You may remember in the beginning, I said simplicity sells. If you were to walk in with this slide, that would not sell, okay? Too many words. However, it's very important for you to understand how to leverage the definition of dry eye to your advantage. I'm, this, the, the definition up there is actually truncated. I know the whole definition, and I'm just going to tell it to you once so you hear it, okay? The most recent definition for dry eye, as established by the Dry Eye Workshop in 2017, is dry eye disease is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface associated with a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular surface symptoms in which tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, inflammation, and neurosensory abnormalities play etiologic roles. Can you believe that? That is a mouthful. And if you dare to go into an office and actually say that or talk to a doctor, their mind will be on their, on their evening plans before you can finish that sentence, all right? So how do you leverage the diagnose, the definition of dry eye disease to make it impactful? Well, simplify. If you were to ask the average doctor of the seven terms which are present in that definition, which one matters to you most? Let me tell you what you'd probably hear. One, symptoms. Two, tear film instability. And three, inflammation. Which one of those three 
Does Optima IPL address all of them? That's the beauty. When you've whittled down what doctors care most about in that lengthy definition, we find they care most about the three things that we can actually speak to with this device. Three things, inflammation, symptoms, and tear from stability. I'll show you, I'll flash up some studies in a little bit just to give you a sense of, yeah, we actually have evidence supporting the role of IPL in those three most critical aspects of this disease. Also, let me remind you that in the definition is the word multifactorial, multifactorial. And you know why that's important? Here's a little pearl for you. Multifactorial diseases may require multifactorial treatment. Again, as ophthalmologists, the bottom of that period, as eye care professionals, we're already comfortable with that concept. Just think glaucoma. In glaucoma, we have three ways to lower the eye pressure pharmacology, lasers, and surgery. That's it. And we're okay. We get that. There's a multiple modality approach to the treatment of glaucoma. So why shouldn't we have the same way of thinking when it comes to dry eye? Because if you ask the average doctor who believes in inflammation, what ways do you have to control inflammation other than pharmacology? you will get a very blank look back at you because there's nothing. Why should a multifactorial disease have only one strategy to combat inflammation? Pharmacology. By pharmacology, it means drops in omega-3. There's nothing else. So IPL, this light therapy, is truly unique in that regard that we can assist this definition, this multifactorial concept, with truly a multiple modality approach to treating the inflammation. So important. So we simplified that definition. Let's take the next slide. Again, <laughs> a lot of words on this slide. I'm not gonna go through all the words, don't worry. But this slide speaks to algorithms. How many of you have had a, a potential customer say to you, where in the algorithm would I use IPL? Where in the algorithm of treating dry eye? Would, would IPL, where would that fall? So like I've said to you now several times, simplicity sells, simplicity sells. I should say that this slide, the reason this slide is up here and it has so many words is it shows that again, IPL has become part of the standard of care. This again is the recommendations from the, uh, the TFOS group in 2017 that gave us that definition. And the point of this slide is simply just to show that you know what, IPL has even reached the standard of care. But more importantly, how do you answer that question about the algorithm? How do you keep things simple? Simple. Well, the way I tell doctors is I, I tell them to think of two really low-hanging fruits, two examples, patient examples that we can all relate to, that we see on a regular basis. And here they are. You say this, Doc, have you ever had a patient, this is number one, have you ever had a patient who has tried traditional therapies for dry eye and is still suffering? I guarantee you, you get yes. Well, those, that's one example. If you have a patient who's tried traditional therapies, has been to many doctors, that's a perfect opportunity to introduce IPL, right? And we all have those patients, the one who just don't respond to drops, to plugs, to omega-3s. We all have them. So that's number one example on the algorithm. The second opportunity, the second low-hanging fruit might surprise you because it's at the complete opposite end of the algorithm. It's in the new patient who you've never seen before, walks into your office and says, look, I get it, I've got dry eye, but I really don't like using drops. Or I'm just too busy, I can't remember, I'm not good at putting them in. Both examples are opportunities, huge opportunities. Both examples will connect with doctors because we have tons of patients in both categories. The patients who've been on it all and the patients who've been on none we have patients who just don't want to use drops. Imagine saying to a patient, hey, you've got dry eye. Would you be interested in a drug-free, drop-free approach? How appealing is that? It's very appealing, particularly appealing to patients who perform more, quote, natural approaches to this disease and aren't really interested in putting pharmacologic chemicals in their eye. So with thus those two examples, you can immediately connect with doctors about where in their algorithm they would introduce this at the, both the beginning and the end. And of course, there's opportunities in between both. But just to, again, organize thinking, because if you organize thinking, you're much more effective in the sale. To organize thinking, 
doctors can relate to those two very straightforward examples there. Very important. All right, next slide, please. This slide is designed to help us understand the mechanism of action. Again, I've said to you in that pyramid, inflammation is one of the key reasons we're talking about IPL. It's huge. It's right in the middle of that pyramid, there, inflammation. And I'll say it to you again, if we're not treating the inflammation, we're not treating the disease. That's what sets this treatment apart. We talked about there's no other way besides pharmacology, okay? Some doctors will say to you, no, wait a minute. I don't really buy that this is an inflammatory disease. They might say to you, I think it's inflammatory sometimes. And to those doctors, I present a very simple scientific scenario that helps them understand why chronic dry eye disease is always inflammatory. I'll ask them, does osmolarity go up or down in dry eye? And most doctors know it goes up. If you put a healthy cell inside a hyper osmolar environment, do you know where the fluid goes? Well, for those of you who know in basic biochemistry, basic os os osmosis, fluid will flow out of the cell into the more concentrated environment. And you know what happens to that cell? It shrinks, it collapses, it releases inflammatory markers, which feed back to the lacrimal gland, further decreasing tear production, raising osmolarity again. That's the cycle. You can't break it. In any chronic dry eye state, no matter what its cause, you will develop inflammation. See? Now, when it comes to the mechanism of action, there are many proposed mechanisms of action for IPL. And once again, if doctors ask you to explain the mechanism of action, my suggestion to you, and this is like the 10th time I've said this, is to keep it simple. So you can see there's several examples on the bottom. I even have more than that. Let me help you with this. When you think about, when you have to explain the mechanisms of action for IPL, there are four. There are four, and you could obviously make it more complex, but in order to organize that you're thinking there, thinking, I want you to present four mechanisms of action. Remember the number four, and here they are. Number one, warming the meibomine glands, okay? It might improve the viscosity of the, of the meibom. It may make it easier to express. I have to admit to you, in my mind, that's the least important. That's the one many doctors know about, but in my mind, that's the least important. So we'll say that's the first, warming of the meibomine glands. Second mechanism of action, keeping it simple, is it is control. It, it's anti-inflammatory. All right, we can see absolute decreased levels of all sorts of interleukins and cytokines, and I'll show that to you in just a little bit. So number two mechanism decreases inflammation. Third, demodex. Okay, demodex are those little mites that um, it are near, it's nearly ubiquitous in patients over 60, the little mites that live on the eyelashes and they create, wreck all sorts of havoc on the meibomian glands. Um, doctors oftentimes miss this. They can be difficult to treat. But once again, if you say to a doctor, hey, did you know that the light of IPL will barbecue these little mites? Okay, you connect with them. So now we've got three mechanisms of actions that are very relatable, warming the gland, treating the inflammation, killing the mites, and the fourth and final mechanism of action is the word photobiomodulation, all right? That's a big word, and most doctors won't know it, but in essence, what that means is the light's absorbed by the mitochondria, improving cellular energy metabolism, improving cellular energy metabolism and production. So cells become better at doing things like producing collagen. The immunomodulatory cells become better at treating and managing inflammation. We see an improved efficiency of cellular activity. Four mechanisms of action, keeping it simple, warming the glands, treating the inflammation, killing the mites, improving cellular metabolism. There you have it, all right? Doctors will relate to that. It's impressive, it's comprehensive, and you will not find other devices that can speak to those four things. Next slide, please. This is just some data um, for you um, to look at. Um, if you do want to bring something around to your doctors, this is one of the more impressive studies. The one on the top came from the American Journal of Ophthalmology's 2017 November issue. And it looks specifically at levels of inflammatory markers pre and post treatment, at four weeks after treatment and at 12 weeks after treatment. And the reason this study is so impactful, if you bring this one around, 
Doctors who are skeptical may say to you, and I'll talk about skeptical doctors next week, but doctors may say to you, how do you know this is really anti-inflammatory? Well, this study is very provocative, it's well-designed, and it's basic laboratory science. You had people who had inflammatory markers measured pre- and post-treatment, and there is a statistically significant decrease in levels of MMP9, among other inflammatory markers, as measured at week four and week 12. So I encourage you to carry that study around with you. It's indisputable, it's extremely compelling, and demonstrates the anti-inflammatory effect. The bottom, it comes from a different study and shows that, believe it or not, the actual treatment can improve both the morphology and the function of the glands. So for those who are doubtful that the light has a positive impact on the glands, here are pictures. Pictures are extremely valuable. If you can show doctors this, if you can show patients this, a picture of the improved meibomian gland is very, very impactful. Uh, next slide, please. Again, I'm, I'm just showing these evidence slides. You may remember, if you think back to the definition, I told you there were three parts to that definition that doctors care about, right? We talked about um, symptoms tear film stability, and inflammation. I just showed you the evidence for the inflammation because remember I told you that guess what? Those are the three things doctors care about and that's what IPL manages. And I'm giving you the evidence for it now. So we saw the inflammation. Here's the evidence for the other two, okay? On the left, you see um, tear breakup time, tear breakup time, and you can see that the tear breakup time, in other words, tear film stability is improving after treatment with IPL. And the graph on the right, is a survey of symptoms, and you can see that symptoms are decreasing. Symptoms are decreasing, according to the, this is called the speed analysis. Symptoms are decreasing after, after, um, after recurrent treatments with the IPL. So those, these two slides are there to give you the confidence that this device is actually treating the three parts of the definition doctors care about. The definition of a disease that is wildly ubiquitous. See the value here? Next slide, please. Don't panic here, a lot of stuff. I just want you to gaze upon this slide. There are actually 18 published studies. You can see there's, there's three studies um, listed under number five. So it's told 18, 18 peer-reviewed published studies confirming the value of IPL. Just know that, have that handy. When I started doing this in 2010, we had none. It was all anecdotal, which was nice, but doctor said, well, that's great, but show me the evidence. 18 peer-reviewed studies, they're well-designed studies, including prospective, randomized, double-blinded, even placebo-controlled studies, all right? establishing the value of IPL. So for those skeptics out there who don't believe in the science, really important to keep this perspective. We've got a lot of good data now supporting the science behind this device. It's not perfect. I'm not gonna say it is. One of the issues between these studies is that the technique varies a lot between the studies, and I'll talk to you about the technique, technique in just a moment, but still very, very compelling. One other comment about literature that's out there. Some doctors will be concerned about the safety, the safety of this device. They'll say, well, what are the reports of injury to the eye? Well, let me tell you quite comfortably that when patients' eyes are shielded properly, there are no reports of injury to the eye. Now, if you do a literature search, you will find papers that seem to indicate ocular injury after treatment. Um, one of them came from Baskin and Palmer, and I have it right in front of me. The title of this article, which was published in um, Ophthalmology Plastic Surgery, Volume 27, the title is Ocular Damage Secondary to IPL Treatment to the Face. Whoa, if you saw this, you might say, I'm not so confident about this, but let me just read you what it says. In the case report, the goggles were removed during application prior to the treatment. That's right. Safety goggles were used during, I, during the procedure, but removed to reach the small areas around the upper eyelid. So the point is, while these examples do exist in the literature, all of the examples that exist either were due to lasers, not IPL, or in the case of the reports of damage to IPL, 
None of them were shielded properly. There are no reports in the literature of damage to the eye when proper shielding is done, period. And that's really important to remember as well. All right, Mark, next slide. I'm going to leave a little time for questions here. So if you're thinking of any, I will leave some time. I want to now talk to you about the treatment protocol. Um, again, we can go to the next slide. And again, uh, the key is simplicity. Uh, this, the, the, more, the more simple this treatment appears to doctors, because remember, one of the issues with dry eye disease, one of the reasons doctors didn't like it was a sense of inefficiency. So we always have to be mindful of that. It always has to come across as efficient. This is not an inefficient way to treat this disease. So, um, simplicity, so having a very simple approach to this is important. Quick comment about diagnostics. Many of your doctors may be using diagnostics. They might range from the old-fashioned Shermer's test which is that little strip you see in the bottom left corner there. We have more modern tests such as osmolarity testing, inflammadry, which measures MMP9 levels, et cetera. Uh, just one quick comment I want to make about diagnostic tests. Diagnostic tests are excellent. They truly are. Um, and the greatest value of diagnostic tests is that they objectify this disease. They take a disease which is kind of ambiguous, amorphous, and protean, and objectify it. It gives patients myomarkers. It improves compliance. It helps them understand the disease. But there's a big but here. Just because a diagnostic test is negative, it does not therefore follow that they don't have dry eye disease. And the reason I say that to you is um, I, if doctors invest in a treatment, if they get my biography and they look at the my biography and it's normal, they might say to you they're not a candidate for IPL. Or they might get a, a, a normal osmolarity test or a normal MMP9. Again, the dry eye tests, when they're positive, are valuable. When they're negative, you can still have dry eye disease. Furthermore, even if the biography appears normal, let me remind you, I made an important comment about the tear film layers. This treatment is still valuable in patients with normal meibomian gland structure and function. Why? Because if you think about those mechanisms of action, remember I said there were four? Only one of those four had anything to do with the meibomian gland. Just to review, the four mechanisms of actions were warming the glands, treating the inflammation, treating demodex, and improving cellular metabolism. Only one. So even if you have normal appearing glands and you don't have dysfunction, you've got three additional mechanisms of action that remain relevant. So it is important to remind your doctors that while positive tests are important, a negative test does not eliminate the relevancy of IPL for your patient. Very important. Okay. Um, next slide. <clears throat> I think most of you know this. Um, oftentimes, um, we talk about who's a good candidate, and I oftentimes will joke, well, if they have dry eye and skin, they're a good candidate. But realistically, there are some patients who we need to be careful with with this treatment. And as you know, in the Fitzpatrick scale, um, we generally be, have to be careful with patients. In my practice, I'm very careful with patients four and higher, definitely five and six. You can treat four, but you need to be careful with this. As you know, the light of IPL can interact, um, can interact um, with um, melanin and in some cases called pigmentary changes. You guys, again, are very familiar with the technology. How do you explain it to doctors? When a doctor says to you, how does IPL work? I tell them, look, this is light. It's light that's been filtered so that only certain wavelengths get through. The wavelengths that, that, the wavelengths that get through are selectively absorbed by target tissues, affecting the desired change without impacting surrounding tissues. And I say, well, well what, is the, what is the target tissue in dry eye? And as you know, of course, the target in this case is oxyhemoglobin, amongst other things. But as we know, there is also some cross-reactivity with melanin in certain places, so we do need to be remain mindful of that. It's no problem. There are some patients who are just not good candidates for IPL because of dark pigmentation, just like there are many procedures for whom there are also not good candidates. And not having uh, universal good candidates for any given procedure is nothing new in medicine. So this should not be an obstacle, but it is an important thing to discuss to remind doctors that if you're going to treat a patient who has a lot of pigment, please do a test spot in, a, in an inconspicuous area to make sure that they don't have any kind of pigmentary changes associated with it. Um, next slide. <clears throat> yeah, pretreatment guidelines. Again, a lot of words here. Um, <laughs> let me 
in my practice, the beauty of this is again, how simple it is. Do I change my schedule for these patients? No, they're fit right into my day. It takes me five minutes. Generally what I do is a complete eye exam. I meet the patient, I do a complete eye exam, and at that point I schedule them for their treatments separately on a separate day. And they come in then on a, you could do it on the same day, but I like to take care of, do a complete eye exam, talk to them about it, have them meet the financial coordinator, et cetera. They come back for the treatments, they come in, my technician brings them into the room, turns the machine on. I walk in, I always perform my treatments. I do believe it's beneficial for the doctor to do it, not only for safety and, and mechanics of it, but I think that five minutes of patient doctor interaction is very valuable. A drop of proparacaine, I shield the eye and I talk, I'll talk about that in a moment. And I do, and I perform the treatment, which I'll share with you in a moment as well. This takes me five minutes. I ask them, yes, to remove makeup beforehand. I advise them not to tan beforehand. If they're on medications that are photosensitizing, such as doxycycline or Accutane, I ask them to discontinue that a couple of weeks before. Um, I do use some a thin layer of coupling gel, which is not a problem at all. So it's very easy for patients. They come in, and in terms of uh, aftercare, there's virtually none. Um, they go their separate way. They go their way. I mean, it's going to be a lunchtime procedure. It's just so easy to do. But I want to talk to you a little bit more about the technique. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. And this is really important for you to hear because one of the challenges that we do face with IPL is that there is some inconsistency in technique. Doctors are approaching this different ways. Um, for example, Dr. Toyos and I, um, independently came upon the value of this treatment. And he, of course, had a, his way of doing it. I didn't even know what he was doing it. So back in 2010, I did it my way. And now what we see is we have two different kind of pathways. The first, the way I want you to think about this as when people ask you about technique, again, keeping it simple, doc, you have two choices. You have a basic strategy and a more advanced. All right, basic strategy and more advanced. I do advise starting with the basic strategy, and by basic strategy, I mean the Toyos approach, the way you've probably been doing it, because if you start with the advanced treatment, uh, then you have nowhere to go. If you start with the basic treatment and you have a patient who is, who is not satisfied, well, then at least you can make some modifications. So I do recommend starting with the basic. So from the beginning, one of the differences between basic approach and advanced approach is how are you going to shield the eye? In the basic approach, which you're probably most familiar with, are those adhesive shields or goggles, which are fine, and that allows you to treat um, the lower, uh, below the lower lid, tragus to tragus, et cetera. Um, and, but what it does not allow you to do is treat the upper eye, eyelid. And for me personally, I've always been baffled. Why would we not treat the upper eyelid? Why would we believe that this disease process only affects half the eyelid? Just the lower, not the upper. Well, of course it doesn't. It affects both. So in my mind, it's always made sense to treat eyelid, upper eyelid. But of course, you can't do that with a goggle. You can't do that with an adhesive shield. So for me, I've always used the items shown on the left, metal corneal shields. They're readily available in almost any medical catalog. They're inexpensive. Um, they're autoclavable. And it simply allows, it's like a metal contact lens with that little tab. It goes underneath both eyelids, which gives you the ability to safely treat both upper and lower lids. All right, so that's sort of the more advanced approach. Um, go ahead and advance the slide. And uh, this slide here, again, shows the um, sort of technique. This is the basic technique. It's that tragus to tragus lower eyelid approach, which is absolutely fine. Also notice, if you see in the upper right corner, the size of the light spots, that's the larger applicator. In the more advanced technique, again, I put a drop of proparacaine in the eye, metal corneal shield, and here's the key point, I use the small tip, that small applicator. If you think about the very tip of the pyramid we talked about, I said to you, why Optima, why M22? And one of the advantages of that is that changeable tip size, that we have the option of using a really small tip. And in my hand, that allows me to get around the contours of the eye uniquely well. It allows me to get right up to the lid margin where we want to treat the glands. So in the more advanced technique, again, I'm putting on the smaller tip. 
using a metal corneal shield, treating the upper and lower lids. I do two passes, overlapping spots by about 20%. Okay? I use a little topical coupling gel. No anesthesia is necessary. No anesthesia is necessary. It's the tip because of that, the cooling mechanics of the tip. Again, a unique feature of the Optimum IPL. Because of that, it's comfortable, even treating the upper lid. Okay? I'll talk about expression in just a moment. Ne uh, next slide, please. And again, uh, three, I use about four treatments, four to five treatments. They're separated by about four months. I'm uh, separated by one month each, excuse me. Um, patients come in once a month. Treatment takes five minutes to in and out. Um, also, remember, simplicity sells. Take a look at this. Obviously, the settings can be preset, but the point I want to show you is notice that in the different skin types, almost all the settings are the same. You don't have to sit there and try to figure this out. I've even gone one step further, and in skin types one through three, I use the same fluents. I use 16. That's the fluence I use, 16 joules per centimeter squared. So honestly, on my skin types one through three, I'm not even changing the settings. It works. I do believe we have to increase the fluence a little bit. The higher fluences are more similar to what we use in facial rosacea. So again, my settings typically, skin types one through three, 16 joules per centimeter squared using the 590 filter, triple pulse, six on, 50 off, chiller on, that's it. <laughs> again, five minutes, five minutes this takes me to do. Um, go ahead and skip to the next slide, and you can actually skip beyond that. The next slide looks at settings for facial rosacea. We don't, I'm not going to focus on that today. Let me just make one comment about that. If you have doctors that do, that do want to, in fact, expand beyond the eyelids and treat the face through photofacial aesthetics, again, very easy to do. And one of the huge advantages, again, over the M22 of our other devices is you don't have to switch out a huge handpiece. You can just change the filter. So for docs who are interested in expanding their offering to more aesthetic treatments, boy, is that easy to do. You can do the face. Before you know it, you're from the neck and the chest, and there's all sorts of things that can come away from that. And that can be appealing to some doctors who do want to make that transition. But I'm going to save the discussion of those aesthetic treatments um, potentially for another time. Um, let's go ahead and advance, though, to the next slide. Um, and again, a quick comment about expression. I don't do it. I haven't done it um, since 2010. But let me clarify. I don't do it therapeutically. So I don't sit there with a probe. I don't sit there with one of those compressor devices and squeeze all the glands. That is uncomfortable. Um, it can induce inflammation. Those glands are delicate and the pressure of squeezing them can, be, can actually damage them. It can crush them. So what I do is very gently, I express one or two glands on each eyelid just for diagnostic purposes. Again, not therapeutic, for diagnostic purposes, just to see is the consistency of the myelin improving from visit to visit? So I do it for diagnostic purposes. Um, but expression itself is not necessary, which can, again, be very compelling because we want this to be an efficient procedure. We want doctors to think they can do this and get out and get the results without sitting there and probing or expressing all of these glands, um, which is just optional. It's just optional and doesn't need to be done. And, of course, um, 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 uh, sunscreen is recommended if they're going to be out in the sun afterwards. But again, most patients go right back to work. They don't have significant erythema. They don't have discomfort. Um, they didn't need numbing cream, so their face isn't numb. Very, very easy to do. Um, and finally, I know I'm going to give time for questions. Just a quick comment on pricing. In my practice, um, we offer a package of, 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 all, of all the uh, treatments together, um, but you have the option, if they want to, of paying as they go, either way. We do give them an incentive to buy a package by offering them a fifth treatment for free. Um, but the beauty of this treatment, unlike Lipiflow or other one-off treatments, is if they want to, they can pay as they go, as they go along. Um, next slide, I believe it's just the last slide, which is just quite simply, I think, my email address. I'm going to give you a chance to ask some questions. I, I want to just, again, I hope this, convers this first of two conversations um, has inspired you a little bit to feel confident and excited about the science. If you can communicate that passion to your doctors, it's contagious. They're going to be interested. It's extremely compelling science. This is literally one of the best kept secrets in eye care. And you should be excited to have the opportunity to talk to docs about this 
That's my email address. Feel free to reach out to me anytime if you run into obstacles or challenges or questions. I'm more than happy to field them for you. Um, but I think you guys should be excited about this. Um, Mark, it's up to you. It's all right with you. I'm going to open up the questions. Um, any, any, uh, I hope everybody's still out there. I haven't been talking to myself for an hour, but happy to uh, <laughs> field any questions about something I said or didn't say. Okay, can I have one question, please? Everybody's an expert. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, one question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Uh, hi, th this is uh, Paris, uh, Regional Sales Manager for Luminous for EMEA. Uh, thank, first of all, I wanted to thank you uh, for uh, this wealth of information. It was uh, very informative. Uh, and it's refreshing to hear uh, your view about uh, everything. Uh, you mentioned uh, treating the upper eyelid uh, mm -hmm. uh, b before. Uh, uh, obviously, you, you're changing also the light guide using the, the smaller light guide, correct? Yes, that's right. And uh, you use the same energy levels, or do you decrease it when you use it when you are uh, treating the upper eyelid? I, I keep it the same. It's at 16. It's at 16 for upper and lower. If I have a patient who is sensitive to the light, I'll come down in the fluence a little bit. But I can tell you, most patients have no problem tolerating 16. And again, it, those, those settings are a little closer to what we might see at facial rosacea treatments. So they tend to work very well. Is there any risk uh, due to uh, the uh, anatomy of the, uh, of the eyelid? I mean, that he cannot dissipate as much as uh, when you treat the, the lower eyelid? N no, uh, there really isn't. Um, I, I know it's, it's obviously thinner. Um, but with that corneal shield in place underneath, uh, I mean, there there has been no issues, none whatsoever. And again, I have I have literally been doing this treatment for close to 10 years, um, and it is extremely well tolerated. Um, there have been some cases of lash loss, but they're rare. It doesn't happen much. Because you're using the, the smaller light guide, you can navigate around the lashes. And even in those cases, most of the time, they have grown back. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? We do have uh, one question in the, the comments box, uh, Richard, if I, if I read that. Um, Okay. Is regarding disposable eye shields. What would be the alternative to these disposable eye shields? Because some doctors say they're quite expensive. Um, do you have any comments to that? Well, absolutely. I don't use them. I've never used disposable eye shields. Like I said, I have I have one set of metal metal corneal shields which I have used. They're autoclavable. I I I, I can get two sets, um, and I have not had to replace them once. I have never once bought a disposable eye shield. And one of the beautiful things of this procedure is we, we don't we don't need disposables. They're not necessary. And I actually feel more confident in a metal corneal shield. I feel it provides a like, better protection. And certainly with treating the upper lid, you can't even use disposable um, adhesive shields. So that to me has is is an easy solution to that one. That's it. And so do we have any more questions at all on the phone? If not, um, if you think of any questions following the webinar, um, Richard's email address is, is on the screen there for everybody to see. Uh, you're also welcome to feedback any questions through Luminous Vision. And I think in that case, if we if we have no more questions, I think um, I'd like to thank you very much, Richard, for this very interesting presentation. Um, we have recorded the session, so we will make that recording available for anybody who would like to rewatch this presentation. And look forward to the second part next week. Yeah, uh, I got disconnected for a moment. Yeah, I'm back now. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was. Uh...
it was most useful, man. You're very welcome. Um, I, it's been a pleasure to speak with you guys. And again, next week, what I would like to do with you, instead of focusing so much on the science, is to focus on the sale. How do you actually maximize the conversation with doctors? What What is the perspective of a doctor um, that makes these sales more meaningful, more effective? So um, we can talk about some different behaviors that we see amongst doctors, reasons for resistance, and how do you navigate them? What are some of the best questions you can ask to create an important conversation that leads to a sale? So we can focus on the more of the nuances of the conversation with doctors at the next visit, next conversation. Sound good? Fantastic. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you all very much. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you. talk to you again real soon. We'll do this next week. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Thank very you. Good. Bye. 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 Have a great day. Bye-bye.